Well, I was reading in, in uh, Acts just the other day, and I came across this little phrase in the last verse of chapter 5, where it says, And daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And really the plan for today is to teach and to preach. So for the morning we're going to do the preaching, the, the teaching. Then in the afternoon there'll be an opportunity for us to talk it over. And then in the evening for any who can stay and any who come additionally, we're going to preach it. That's sort of the pattern of it. And why are we doing this? Well, because I think what God has done in Jesus Christ is just so wonderful. The comprehensive nature of the salvation that he has provided for us, to me, excites me constantly. Almost every time I open my Bible, I see aspects of what God has done, and I think the whole world should know this. And especially the church should know this, and see just how wonderfully God has provided for us. So that's the idea. And um, if you saw what we were, the, the little kind of presentation that was running when you came in, the pattern is that we'll start now at 10 o'clock for our first session, and that will run till 11. Then we'll have 25 minutes for a break and a cup of coffee. And then there'll be the second session, which will run for an hour. And then there'll be an hour's break for lunch. And then after that, we'll do some talking amongst ourselves. And then after that, there'll be this thing that we call the Bible panel which isn't intended to be um, the sum of all knowledge gathered together around one table. It's, at the moment, there are three of us, so it'll be like three wise monkeys, um, you know, who one saw nothing and one heard nothing and one said nothing. I've often thought that was an interesting kind of picture because at any one time, of course, it means that 66% of those monkeys could either see or hear or speak. That's not a bad proportion, actually, 66%. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with statistics. Um, we're going to sing a hymn. Um, this is a, a, a hymn, a Wesley hymn, which begins, Ye Happy Sinners. Um, and it's got some wonderful lines in it, and uh, Rich is going to pray for us. So we'll, we'll start off with that. Jesus Christ, we thank you for the good news that we do not have to remain what we always have been. We thank you, Lord, that this was the brand that you put on him from his birth, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Lord, we do pray today that as we gather and try to follow what you have done, that you'll give us light, Lord, and understanding, and quicken us again, and excite us with the glory of this gospel. Lord, will you bless us as we gather? Will you bless our fellowship, Lord, and give us real heart understanding of the things that we need to talk about? We love you, we bless you, and we commit this day and every part of it to you. Amen. 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 Just one moment. The idea of this presentation that I'm going to run in the background is, is really to give you a sort of a road map as we continue. Some of you will know that I'm, I'm not famous for my center direction. Um, and uh, if we get lost, 
Well, you ought to be able to find your own way back um, with this. That's sort of the idea anyway. If you've been looking at the presentation earlier, you would have seen this constant reference to www.biblebase.com. And the reason for that is that my concept for what we're doing is to have a day together like this when we can think and discuss things, but then also to continue the conversations and the thoughts of that days um, with a website. So that's why you'll see all these references. We're going to look at sin, its cause, and its consequence. This may sound not the most exciting topic uh, to start with, but this is what it's all about. This is what the Bible is all about. It's all about what God's original intention for us was, and what went wrong, and what God has done to remedy it. So we're going to have a look at, um, this is the first hour session, we're going to have a look at angelic sin, not in great detail, just enough to give us some shape, and then human sin, and then we're going to look at the nature of sin. So we'll start off with the angel's sin. And we're going to look at, first of all, at the nature of angels to see if there's things in the character, the nature, the constitution of angels which have affected certain things. And then we're going to try and trace as much as we can, and it won't be very much, just exactly where sin came from originally. Okay, we're going to do those two things together. What's the purpose of the Bible? Well, you know it's not intended to be a, a compendium of all world knowledge. It's not intended to be an encyclopedia of every possible thing. It's not intended to be a chronicle of world history. It's really a very selected account of, of men. It's really men's story. It's the story of the way that God prepared the world in order to put man into it. And the way in which man, when placed into it, almost immediately, apparently, overthrew everything that God had intended to do by a certain activity that we'll look at in a little moment. But there's another story that isn't the Bible's story, but it's a story which touches our story, and that really is the angel's story. Now, it's important to realize that the Bible is not the, sto is not the record of the angel's story. It's the record of man's story. And we only know a tiny little bit about the angel's story. In fact, it's, only, it's like these two center, these two circles. And it's at that point of the intersection where their story touches our story that we get some little glimpses about what happened to the angels. There's, there's lots and lots about angels that we have no knowledge of and God hasn't revealed it to us. And when God hasn't revealed a thing, it's better to leave it alone. God knows what we need. Our instruction in the way that God leads us is in what they would call in a war footing on a need-to-know basis. And God has only given us what we need to know about angels. And there's all kinds of speculations that people might have about angels, and they're irrelevant to what God really wants us to understand. But just where that intersection lies... There are some things that we can see about the angel's story where we can see the impact that it's had on ours. One of the things about angels, of course, is that they are different to human beings in that they are not fixed in a body. So they, as far as we can understand, they don't have to go through time. They don't have a yesterday and a today and tomorrow. They don't have schedules that they work through. They don't begin as babies and grow and get old and then die. They are immortal from the moment of their creation. This makes them quite different to us. And secondly, of course, there's no heredity that's passed down from one to another because all the angels, as far as we can understand, were created in one moment. There are no angel sons and there are no angel parents and grandparents. The whole angel creation was created all in one moment. And then, as regards their sin, there was no outside intervention. Their sin did not take place as a result of external temptation. It wasn't something on the outside that came into them 
somehow their sin was different. It arose from the very center of them in some way. So, what do we know about the history of the angel's sin? Well, there are two passages of Scripture which some Christians, some would question these passages and say, well, I don't think it's really saying what you think it's saying. But I, I think these two passages give us a glimpse into that tiny intersection. Remember, what we're talking about is the little bit of the angel's story that intersects with our story. It's just a very small portion, but it gives us enough to get some idea of what's happening. And there are two passages of Scripture in particular where this happens. One is Isaiah 14, and I always remember it. I've remembered it like this for about 40 years now. Remember it because if you double 14, you get 28, and then all you've got to remember is that it's Ezekiel. So it's Ezekiel, it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where we have prophecies. And these prophecies begin in the way that prophecies often begin. They sort of begin at ground level. They begin talking about human kings, people who have territorial empires. But in the middle of these prophecies, you suddenly feel the prophecy lifts off and it becomes airborne and you discover it's saying things that could never really have been applied to a human being. It's almost as though what's happened with the prophet is he has begun to speak about a human individual, but in the power of his prophecy, his prophetic gift has taken him beyond the person to the power that's behind him. And he sees the power behind these kings who were the enemies of Israel. And the first one is um, the king of Babylon, and the second one is the prince uh, or the king of Persia. I'm going to get my Old Testament. <clears throat> so if you'd like to turn to Isaiah 14, this is really just so that you, you will see where it is on the page. And... Um, it's Isaiah 14... And I'm just going to read these verses and hopefully you yourself will put them into context by reading around these things later. So this is Isaiah 14 and from verse 12. And I'm going to be reading from my, um, what I call my SMKGV. That's a slightly modified King James Version. It's really a King James Version with a few of the F's taken out for uh, communication's sake. This is um, Isaiah 14, verse 12, and I'll read down to verse 15. How are you fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, this is one of the things that we begin to see in this story, that angelic sin began in the heart of the angels. It wasn't an outward rebellion to begin with, it was something that began on the inside. And you'll see in both of these scripture references where we'll look at, you get this focus on the fact that there was something that happened on the inside. Of course, things that happen on the inside are hidden from everybody except God. Because nothing is hidden from God, and He knows what's on the inside as plainly as He knows what's on the outside. You have said in your heart, I will ascend. Just look how this power of assertion comes out in this passage. I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Five times you get this statement, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And we discover from this tiny segment of what we know of the angel's story, that this is an issue of will. This is an issue where the angelic beings determined not to go the pattern of Jesus all those years later when he said, not my will, but thy will be done. But they chose the opposite, and they said, not thy will, but my will be done. And you get this statement, and it was in the heart. It wasn't to begin with an outward protest. It wasn't an outward rebellion. To begin with, it was an inward thing, a thought, a concept, a determination. I will, I will, I will. You can almost feel the accumulation of the power as this angelic being sets himself to defy God. 
I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now maybe you remember that is the lie that Satan fed into the human race. God knows, he said to Adam, that in the, the day that you eat that of, he said to Eve, in the day you eat of it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And this is a satanic lie. And it's this satanic lie really which is at the base of, base of all sin that a person who isn't God, a creature who isn't God, can actually become God, can actually defy God, can actually set up a throne at least alongside God, can be equal with God. It's the ultimate rebellion. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 28... I'm not going to go into lots of detail in these. I just want to draw your attention to them so you can see the shape of the angel's sin. Because their sin has had its effect upon ours. So this is um, Ezekiel 28. Read the first six verses. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying... Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up. Can you see this again? Because your heart is lifted up. Every time it gives you these little glimpses of satanic rebellion, you see this thing in the heart, where there's a decision in the heart, and ultimately it works its way out. Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. What an amazing statement that is. You set your heart as the heart of God. One of the things we're going to see, and we will really need to understand this if we're going to understand what Christ did on the cross, is that ultimately sin is a clash of wills. Ultimately, sin is a clash of wills. It's saying, I will. I will, I will. My opinion is as good as yours. My choice is as good as yours. I will not bow the knee. I will not bow to your throne. I will have my own throne by the side of your throne and you will regard me as I regard you and we are equals. That is at the heart of sin. Okay, the next little section goes on. I'm jumping ahead, verse 14. You are the anointed cherub covers and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in thee. This is about all we really know of the angel's sin. There is a mystery of iniquity. People often love to ask this question, well, if God who is good created everything that's good, how could this possible... That's part of the angel's story. It's not part of our story. Our story only knows a little bit about the angel's story, and I have no doubt that one day we shall understand all these things. But the point is, this is the bottom line, there was a moment when iniquity was found in him when he was no longer perfect in all his ways. This, and if you read the Bible, you, this comes out very plainly. Satan was the greatest of God's creation. He was the supreme created being. And there are certain things he did, we can, which we follow on to see these little sections here. Here we go again, verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. That's a, that to me is a very provocative thought. In different parts of the Bible you've got visions of the supreme angelic beings who are known as cherubim, the burning ones, and you see them in closeness to God. You see them worshipping God. And they're always supremely God conscious. They're not conscious about anything else at all. Uh, the Bible actually refers to angels as holy angels, the ones who didn't rebel. But the holy angels have no consciousness of their own holiness. They're only conscious of God's. 
They have no conscience of their own glory, and they are the most magnificent beings that have ever been created. But they have no consciousness of it. They only have consciousness of His glory. They are creatures who are wonderfully focused upon who God is. But at some point, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. You have, it goes on here, you have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. You have defiled your holy places by the multitude of your iniquities. Did you know that the devil had holy places? A sanctuary, that's what a sanctuary is. It's a holy place. Nowadays when we use the word sanctuary, we normally think about the letter spotted newt or something like that. But that, a sanctuary is just a place set apart absolutely for a purpose and these angelic beings obviously had holy places I don't want to speculate we could do but I'm not going to there are other things that kind of give us some indications parts in the book of Hebrews when it says that the heavenly places had to be cleansed with the blood of Christ but we won't go into that it's just this point I want to make is that this rebellion brought defilement it brought a spoiling. It brought, it, it brought something that had not been and spoiled the situation that God had created. So let's, let's press on and we'll get to human sin now. And we're going to split this up into two parts because I want to make a point about our real topic of the day which is sin, its cause and its cure. So we'll start off with Eve's sin. And uh, if you look in the Bible, you'll uh, see this is not in the Old Testament as you might have expected, but in the New. And it's a little section in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14. Now this passage is talking about authority and responsibility, particularly in the church. So just remember that's the context. But this is what Paul says, and he dips into the historical record of Eve and Adam, and he makes this point. He says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Now let's see if we can unpack this verse and see what it's telling us. It speaks, first of all, about Adam's priority. Adam was created first. He was given unique authority and responsibility and the Bible goes on to say here very plainly in verse 14 that Adam was not deceived so Adam was made first it was to Adam that God actually spoke the words of the commandment he was the one who was responsible and Adam was not deceived it also tells us Eve about Eve that she was deceived but it goes on to say that she was in the transgression there are different kinds of trans a transgressing is actually going across a line that we should not pass. Now, Adam stepped over a line knowing full well what he was doing. Eve stepped over the line earlier, but with no full recognition of what was taking place. She was deceived. Adam sinned with his eyes open. She was beguiled. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 3. She was beguiled, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. So, we'll look at Adam. Authority and responsibility were given to Adam by virtue of his priority. This, is, this has nothing to do with better than, or worse than, or greater than. This simply has to do with responsibility. Adam's sin was a deliberate disobedience. You have a very definite statement here. You must have no sympathy for Adam. You can have some sympathy for Eve, but you must have no sympathy for Adam. Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. Eve, on the other hand, was her sin was what I'm calling here an unconscious sin. That's, that don't mean that she was kind of out for the count when it happened. I, I just simply mean that she was not conscious of what she was doing. You may say, well, shouldn't she have done this? Well, there's all things she ought to have done, 
But the Bible makes it very plain, plain that Eve did what she did because she was deceived. She was deluded, she was beguiled, she was led astray. Adam made his own choices. In the book of Leviticus, in chapter 4, you've got a series of sacrifices, and one of them is for what, in the authorized version, it calls sins of ignorance. And really it means unwitting sins. It means almost accidental sins. Now, I'm not sort of trying to play down the seriousness of what Eve did. I just want to make a point that there is a definite difference between the nature of Eve's transgression and Adam's. Eve stepped over a line not knowing the full significance of what she was doing. Adam stepped over it in direct rebellion against a word that God had spoken to his own heart. Okay, so you can see there's a beginning coming through and uh, it won't surprise you ladies who knew it was always the man's fault anyway. Um, but we shall see that it, it is Adam's fault. Um, these are the consequences of Eve's sin. First of all, God said that he would multiply her sorrow and conception and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Sometimes people call this Eve's curse and uh, even in popular language ladies will talk about the, the women's curse. I want you to notice very plainly from the book of Genesis that nowhere does it say that Eve was cursed. Nowhere. It never says that Eve was cursed. It doesn't even say that this is a punishment. This, in a sense, is a consequence of something that's happened. Um, and it goes on to say, um, Thy desire shall be to thine husband. This is verse 16. And he shall rule over thee. As a result of what happened, there was a change, apparently, in the relationship between man and woman. This is intriguing to wonder what it would have been like without this. But we can't <coughs> linger there too long. But there was a change. But you'll notice that it was to the serpent that God actually said in verse 14, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. In fact, we shall see in the next um, thing we're going on to say that the, the things that were cursed actually were Satan and the earth. We'll uh, follow it through. We'll move on to... Adam's sin. And we'll look at the consequences of Adam's sin. Adam is held personally responsible for what happened in the Garden of Eden. I still do use my King James Version and one of the reasons I use it is because of the these and thous. Not because I like the majesty of it, not because I think it's aesthetically more pleasing, but because there are times when it's vital to know whether God was talking collectively or whether he was talking personally. And um, you will see that God holds man personally responsible for what happened. He held Adam personally responsible. I'll read this passage and emphasize these, um, these and thous. This is verse, from verse 17 of chapter 3. And unto Adam, he said, he's spoken to the serpent, he's spoken to the woman, now he speaks to Adam. And unto Adam, he says, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife. Do you remember how Adam tried to shift the blame and put it on to Eve? And he said, well, it's, it's it really God, it's your fault because the woman that you gave me, she said this and she did this. And God really says, it's not a question of what she said. The sin is that you listened you hearken to the voice of your wife. And hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. You know that Eve was not taken out of the ground. Thou wast taken out of the ground, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Can you see God is putting his finger very definitely on where the blame lies in this? This is Adam 
it's Adam. You've got these three people, if you like, in the garden. You've got the serpent, which is really Satan. You've got Eve and you've got Adam. And God pronounces a curse on the, on the woman. He pronounces a series of consequences on the wife. And then to man, his finger rests on the man's chest in ultimate responsibility. And he says, thou, 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 thou. Adam, it was to you I gave this commandment. It was to you that I gave this responsibility. It was to you. There's something different about Adam. There's all kinds of things that we could uh, pick out of this. Um, as a result of what Adam did, the curse enters the world. That it is in verse 17. Thou shalt not eat of it. Uh, God had said, thou shalt not eat of it. Because of this, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Notice that the earth is in the state it's in because of what Adam did, not because of what Eve did. I'm, I'm building my case slowly here. I hope it's not too slow so that you kind of go asleep with it. But the, the, we, we need to see that Adam is the problem because God's cure is for Adam. And if God can find a cure to deal with Adam, everything else ultimately can be resolved. I remember I'm listening to a, a tape recording some time ago now of um, uh, dear brother Mr. North and he was sharing with the church life school here and he asked the students and the, there's about half a dozen of them around the big Victorian table in the next room next house and uh, he asked this question he said what was the purpose of Christ's death upon the cross and of course you got a little kind of flurry of all to take away our sins and to bring us to God and he said yes 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 what was the real purpose he said and they had another little list of things and he said yes yes what was the real purpose and, and in the end they kind of gave up and he said it was to deal with Adam he said if he had not been able to deal with what Adam had done the rest would have been irrelevant and we need to see where the problem lies because God has to get to the heart of the problem of sin not just the peripheries not just the incidental things around the edges they are serious enough but he has to get to the heart of it. So as a result of Adam's sin, the curse entered the world. And we see from verse 19 too, that the death, that death is on, its, on the way. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The thing is, and this is a very important distinction to make, that apparently Eve's sin had no knock-on effects. Eve's sin did not affect the earth. It did not affect the animals. It did not affect Adam. Adam's sin apparently impacted everything. It impacted the whole of the creation. It impacted the animal world. Why is this? Well, because of the unique place of Adam in God's ordering. And you'll begin to see it if we... Uh, look at another passage of the scripture now I think we're going to go to Romans we're not going to go into detail in Romans although in many ways the only way to do what we're trying to do today is actually just to expound Romans just to kind of begin at the beginning and work our way through it Romans is in we can put it into several sections just for our own convenience but there's there's a point in Romans where there is a change of focus. In the first three or four chapters of Romans, if you've got Romans in your mind, you may be familiar with these. The first three or four chapters, Paul is bringing an accusation against the human race. That we are all guilty before God. There's no difference. All have sinned. And he, he comes down with this devastating indictment. There's none righteous. No, not one. Every, there's not a single person who is not guilty before God. And then he begins to talk about the way that God has been able to continue to deal with men on the basis of a future sacrifice that Christ would make. Thrilling passages of scripture that we can't go into just now. And then he comes into chapter 4 and he asks the question, what shall we say that Abraham our father according to the flesh has found? And then you get Abraham's experience. And you discover that Abraham was the Bible language or the theological language is he was justified by faith. But then you come into Romans chapter 5 and the shape of things begins to change. And it begins to talk not just about our personal infringements of the law, not just about our personal sins, but about another issue altogether. And it's this issue of the arrival of sin. 
So, if you look at Romans chapter 5, and look at verse 12, this begins a section of the scripture which is, in many ways, one of the most important in the New Testament, as regards as understanding just exactly what God has done for us, what the problem was, and what needed to be done. If you, if you don't get the diagnosis right, you're never going to get the right remedy. Um, if, you, if you misdiagnose the human condition, and you say, oh well, really, he hasn't had the chance he ought to have had, or he hasn't had the education. What we need is to feed him better, give him some more books to read, let's do this, this and this. Oh, he just needs a better religion, let's give him a better... None of these will cure the problem. None of them. No religion can cure this problem. And this is why we have to come zero right down and see what Christ came to do. Okay? The arrival of sin, it's a strange title maybe. Why am I talking about the arrival of sin? Well, because it says here, by one man. And um, I'm not going to read this whole section, but if you were to read it, you'd see that again and again, I'll just give you a little illustration here, Romans chapter 5, pick out this word, this one man, and see how God is putting, we saw it in Genesis, God put his finger on Adam's chest and said, thou, 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 thou. Now we'll see again in Romans chapter 5, Paul is doing the same thing, and he's putting his finger on Adam, and he says, this is, this is where it happened. This is where it happened. Verse 12 then, Therefore as by one man, Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not reckoned when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, that it is again, Many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but can you see how Paul keeps on saying the problem, it started off with one man. One man, one man. Les Wilden was kind of saying this thing here just on Thursday night as well with us. This one man, this one man. Okay. And we discover that the one man is very easily identified. It's there in uh, verse 14, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So we know exactly the entry point of sin to the human race. It was Adam. Now please again, I'm just reinforcing what I've said. Notice it wasn't Eve. Now in terms of chronology, Eve's sin was earlier than Adam's. Wasn't it? But in fact, Sin did not enter the world through Eve's sin. It entered the world through Adam's sin. Now this is very significant. I hope we shall see it in a little while. Um, sin entered into the world. Just in the way that you entered this building by coming through a door, so sin entered the human race as a result of Adam's sin. Sin, and this is, this is why we... I started off where I began. Sin is older than the human race. This topic that we often we're talking is sometimes called original sin. But in one sense, that's the wrong title because sin did not originate with Adam. Human sin originated with Adam, but sin is older than the human race. What happened is as a result of Adam's disobedience, sin entered the human race. and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It's almost as though Adam was sort of like the guardian at the gate of the human race. You know the old-fashioned sheepfold that they had in Bible days was, was a kind of a, a circle of stones and a doorway with no door in it. And usually the shepherd actually slept there in the doorway. This is part of the significance of Jesus when he said, I am the door of the sheep. He is the shepherd who sleeps in the doorway, guarding access to his flock. There's a sense in which Adam too was a shepherd. He was intended to stand in the doorway. He was too, if you remember the original commission that was given to him, 
He was to fulfill the earth and to subdue it. He was earth's champion. He was the man that God had chosen to be the defender of all God's purposes in the human race. And not only did he not defend the human race against Satan, but in fact he opened the door wide. And as Paul reckons, states it here in Romans, by one man sin entered into the world. Then we discover in this passage that there's another one man. You can see it in verse 15. He talks about the gift of God, uh, the grace of God and the gift of God which is what by one man, Jesus Christ. And then again in verse 17 you discover again he's talking about um, life coming in by one man, Jesus Christ. And again in verse 19 by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So in this passage of scripture and that's talking of Christ in this passage of scripture Paul is actually drawing our attention to two men two men and he is summing up the whole of human history the whole conflict the whole tragedy the whole purpose of redemption in the story of two men now that's um, a key thing for us to understand because there is a pattern that undergirds much of Paul's teaching it's a very simple one but when you see it you'll begin to see all kinds of things that it touches the pattern is very simple there is one man whose name was Adam and there is another one man whose name is Jesus Christ what shall we call Adam well Adam this isn't brain science as they say this is not rock science. Adam was the first man and Christ is the second man don't be led astray by Wesley's hymn that talks about a, a second Adam to the fight he's not the second Adam he's the second man because this this whole theme is about two men the first man and the second man now there's another way we can talk about this first man and the second man the old man and the new man this, this is not at all complicated, and I hope I'm not making it complicated, but there's a very simple framework that comes out of here, and you hear it expressed beautifully, perfectly, comprehensively, in a very simple phrase of Paul's in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. These are the two options. It's as though there only ever have been two men and all men and women are either part of the one man, the first man, the old man, Adam, or they have become part of the new man, the second man, Jesus Christ. It's a framework for New Testament truth and it'll, it comes out in lots of places in the, Old Test, in the New Testament. Okay, so sin entered. And then it says, and death entered. So you've got a little bit of a, you've got a little procession of things coming into the human race. First, through the open door of Adam's conscious disobedience, steps sin. And through sin comes death. So they come the one after another into the human race. And then it says, death spread to all men. One of the things that people who discuss this topic of original sin or constitutional sin or as I call it congenital sin is the whole issue of transmission. How does Adam's sin get from him to me? Well, I don't believe actually it comes down through my, the father's line. I don't believe it comes down through the mother's line. I was in Adam when Adam sinned. I received sin as a result of Adam. I did not get it from my father and he didn't get it from his father. We all got it from Adam. It's as though all the spiritual genes of the human race were in Adam when he sinned and the, de the defects that were caused in Adam in all those genes, they're there. They're there. Okay, so death spread to all men because all sin. Now, we could go off on a tangent with that and maybe you'll want to talk about some other views of this in uh, the discussion time but we'll get onto those later as by one man sin entered into the world and then it says for all have sinned 
Do you notice that when I listed these things on this presentation, I talk about the sin and the death, and you may think, well, that's a strange way of putting it. Why are you doing that? Well, I'll try and show you if I can. It has heard me. It's just waiting, I think, to kind of... Oh, I see. It's coming on to... The tenses that are used, the, these little phrases, um, by one man's sin entered, that's the aorist tense, I'll tell you what it means in a minute, and then it says, enter the world, and death by sin, and death passed to all men, that's the aorist tense, um, for all have sinned. Each of these verbs is the aorist tense. Now, the aorist tense in its simplest way is just, it's an action complete in a time past. It's not a process, it's not something which is going on, it's something which happened at a moment in time. There's a more modern view of the Irish tense which says, well, it's really just a simple past tense. But whichever view you take, you can still see the truth. Sin entered. Death entered. S death passed, spread through the whole human race. It spread through the whole human race. When? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Several times in this passage in Romans chapter 12, if you look at a Greek New Testament, or if you look at something like Young's literal translation of the Bible, which is a very, very useful Bible study tool, you'll see that he constantly now begins to refer to the sin. And this is something that Paul starts to do from Romans chapter 5, and in between Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, from there to Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, 30 times he puts the definite article in front of the word sin. Because he's not talking about sin as a single transgression. He's not talking about as sin as a single infringement of a law, of a single stepping over of a line. He's talking about sin as a person. He's talking about sin as a nature of something. It isn't just that Adam sinned. That would have been bad enough. What happened was sin entered. And uh, that's really quite an interesting thing to follow through. And then he does the same thing with the death. We're not just talking about death in the sense of absence of life. You'll see later on in Romans he talks about death reigning. Um, it's as though sin and death, they are personifications. They are, they are portraits of a being. They're portraits of Satan himself. Um, this is a quotation here I've just put up from uh, John's Gospel. Jesus therefore said to the Jews who believed in him, If ye may remain in my word, truly my disciples you are, and you shall know the truth. This is Young's literal, so it's a little bit kind of um, wooden. And the truth shall make you free. They answered him, Abraham's seed we are, and to no one have we been servants at any time. How do you say you shall become free? Jesus answered them. Notice the tenses in this. Verily I say to you, everyone who is committing sin is the servant of sin. Everyone whose pattern of life is that they are habitually, that their characteristic is that they are constantly sinning, that person is a slave. And a slave to a person. They're a slave to the sin. It's not just that they're a slave to this habit or that habit, they're actually a slave to a person. And it's, um, it's really only Paul and John um, who do this in this particular way, who put this definite article in front of it to um, stress something. And death arrives too. And that's the death. It becomes the ruler. When? In the day that thou eatest thereof, God said to Adam, you shall die. We need again, I hope this isn't kind of too complicated, um, too dense what we're trying to do, but we need to distinguish in our minds between different kinds of death. God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. But if you read your Bible, you know that Adam lived for another 900 and so many years. Anybody know how many? Like about 960, I think, something like that. So he actually continued to live 
physically for almost another century, millennium, another thousand years. But in fact, God's word was absolutely true. In the day that you eat of it, you will die. Adam died. Something in Adam died. In fact, it wasn't just death as the absence of life. Death stepped in. One of the things I want to say more about this tonight, but death is not just the absence of life, if we understand it from the Bible. It is itself a dynamic power. It's a power which has the ability to affect things. It's not just the absence of life. Sin entered and death entered. God had said it would and it did. It was another 960 years before that death worked itself out in the death of Adam's body. Spiritual death was illustrated 960 years later by physical death, by the offense, by the trespass of one. Okay. I want to talk a little bit now about judgment and condemnation. In chapter 5 and verse 16, and I'll read on to verse 18, it says this, but it's not as by the one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was through one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses to justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by the one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. And then he goes on to say other things. These words, judgment and condemnation, are words that Christians almost continually use in the wrong sense. And they talk about condemnation, you know, I was feeling condemned, or uh, don't say that, brother, because you'll condemn people. Now, the word condemn does, has nothing at all to do with feelings. Nothing at all. It's from a legal background, and in fact, it, it's part of a pattern of things. Judgment and condemnation. One, the judge, word for judgment is crema, it's where we get crime from. And for condemnation, it's catechrema, which really means the full consequence of the judgment, the full carrying through. And they're part of a legal process or framework. In a Roman court case, this, these would be the steps. First of all, there would be the accusation. Then there would be a trial. Then as a result of a trial, the judge, they didn't have a, a kind of a jury as we do, it's more like a magistrate's court, the, the judge would pass his verdict. That would be his judgment. Then following his judgment, there would be the, the sentence. That's to say he would then pronounce the sentence. And those two things, the judge's verdict and the judge pronouncing the sentence, are the technical words judgment and condemnation. And ultimately, of course, the sentence would be carried out, so there would be the execution of it. But Paul is talking about these aspects here. He's talking about this heart of things. The verdict, um, judgment, and the sentence. This Let's go on a bit. By one man's offense. All this. We have this statement, and it's a very important statement. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. For the Bible says, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Or as Young's literal translation says it, for as through the disobedience of the one man, many were constituted sinners. Now it probably doesn't mean constituted in the sense of a, a kind of a human internal constitution, but in the way that constituted is used in a legal sense, that this is a properly constituted assembly or that sort of thing. But it's, it's part of it. Something happened. The whole human race received this judgment and this sentence pronounced by the judge that we were guilty, that we were under God's verdict in this sense. Um, and the whole thing is like that. So we're still part of the legal framework 
to move on a little bit. Here's the verdict. Adam is guilty. What's the sentence? When is the sentence executed? This is um, a quotation here from Young's literal translation. And Jehovah God lays a charge on the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden eating thou dost eat, and of the tree of the knowledge of good and eat, O evil, thou dost not eat of it. For in the day of thine eating of it, dying thou dost die. That's a very strong statement dying thou shalt die it's the ultimate death in in Hebrew idiom when you want to intensify something you double it up so that the lovely phrase that we have in Isaiah thou shalt keep him in perfect peace is actually thou shalt keep him in peace peace and when um, James is writing in the New Testament and he talks about uh, the earnest prayer of a righteous man he actually says that Elijah prayed in his praying. So you double up the word and you intensify it. And God says to Adam, in the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. This is not physical death. This is the ultimate death. You know how the ultimate is used in other things. For example, the king of kings, he is the ultimate king. Or the prince or the lord of lords, he is the ultimate. Or the holy of holies, that's the ultimately the most holy place. Um, or the Song of Songs, that's the ultimately the best song that was ever written. That kind of pattern of things. When is the sentence executed? In the day of thine eating. This sentence came upon the human race at the moment of Adam's sin. The consequence is that every single one of us, as we come into life, as we come into our natural life, come in as constituted sinners. We come in as those upon whom a sentence has already been passed. It is the sentence of death. How are we doing? Pressing on. We've got ten more minutes, I think. We need to look now at the nature of sin. This is Ephesians chapter 2. And we begin to get another glimpse of the power of what happened with Adam's defection. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, And you he has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our way of life in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others sin is a ruler that rules with authority it's not just a technical thing there's real power there is real authority it's it's a spirit that works on the inside it's not just that we're influenced by external temptations there's something on the inside it's a spirit that's working in it's a way of life. That's the old English word conversation. It doesn't mean talking. It means a, a pattern of life. It's a nature. You've heard me often talk about our dog and its nature. Um, we have a, a, a dog that's a, of the breed of a Staffordshire bulldozer. It's their kind, of their kind of solid muscle and not a lot of sense of direction. But this one is really quite well behaved because it's been trained. It's it's got the rosettes to prove that it's been to training college. Twice we did the course, um, same course. Yeah. And it will do, it will sit, and it will come, and it will do all of these things wonderfully as long as there are no cats around. Because if there are cats around, there's a nature inside this thing that breaks through all the institutional laws that I have wrapped around it, and the constitutional law of its nature erupts. There is a nature. There is a nature in human being and given the right circumstances you will see it erupt and when you see it it will terrify you. 
It destroys families. It destroys lives. Germany was the most cultured nation in Europe. It had the finest musicians, artists, philosophers, medical people, university scholars, financial systems. It had all these things. And there was a time when this thing in the nature of man erupted and it became an insane killing machine that launched a war singly to destroy a race of people and turned to Russia and committed almost military suicide because there were Jews in Russia that it had to get to. And it attacked Poland because there were Jews that it had to get to. There was a, there's an insanity in this. Things trigger it at different times. Usually, a veneer of civilization restrains it. It's, it's nicer to get on with your neighbors, whether they are next door or on the next nation. But there are times when it comes down to this nitty-gritty and the nature stirs itself and you see what it's like. I'll tell you what it is. It's the thing that murdered Christ. It's the thing that says, I will not have this man to reign over me. It's the thing that says, I'm setting my throne alongside the throne of God. In my heart, I'll tell you what, I will, I will, I will, I will. That's what it is. Here's the vivid picture of the heart in Daniel chapter 4. Do you know this passage? It's, it's that vision that Daniel, well, the dream that Daniel has um, of a time when Nebuchadnezzar is going to come under the judgment of God. And it's very interesting. Nebuchadnezzar continues in his pride, and the angel watches bring this sentence upon him. And the way that it's expressed in the Bible is it says, let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given to him, and let seven times pass over him. You, you can look at that yourself at your own legend. But it's very interesting that from the heart arises the nature, the character. So in order to make Nebuchadnezzar behave like a beast, the angels gave him the heart of a beast. This is Bible language. It's, it's, not, it's, it's deeper than pictures, but it's showing you that it's the heart that has to be changed. This is Jeremiah. Um, sorry, that's Jesus. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. This is Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Or as Young says, crooked is the heart above all things, and it is incurable. This is why it's just a wonderful thing that God never, said, never gave that verdict to the people of Israel until he gave it through the mouth of a man who would also give to them the promise of a new covenant. 